thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to present um, hominin space. Um, I work as a researcher at the Human Origins Department in Leiden, in the Netherlands, and uh, this is my research where I hope to gain a doctorate. Um, I call it a case study in points that will become clear in, in a moment why I call it this way. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this tool that I'm developing. And especially I'm going to tell you uh, about the issues and concerns. Um, issues that I define for myself as something that I hope I solve, and concerns are still open questions or things that I work on. Um, I'm not going to detail all of them, but I'm going to detail some. Um, I would first like to introduce you to uh, Home in Space itself. Uh, it's a tool that we developed to run simulations on a large scale. An explicit model uh, for explorative analysis of homelands in what we call a realistic landscape. Um, I will give you many details in a moment. Um, I put some dynamics in my presentation. I hope it all works. So uh, these details will come forward. Uh, first, I would like to say that when we built this tool, it's not only about the tool, it's not even only about the results, the uh, uh, hypothesis that we test, the, the simulation results that we get, but it's also about the building process itself. Um, when we develop this tool, uh, all kinds of hidden assumptions become clear, and that is also part of um, the product, the, the product that I call my research, Hamlin Space. So there will be a tool, there will be hypothesis answered, but there will also be a lot of assumptions made as explicit. And I think that is one of the main um, gains that we get from modeling. We have to make our model explicit. And these assumptions, they will play a major part later on. Um, first, just the overview, an energy, energy landscape reconstruction where homonym groups are steered by the available energy in the landscape. This energy is reconstructed from climate data. Um, I have a parameterized model for both the agents as well as the environment. Uh, more parameters for the, more, for the agents than for the environment, but still there are some uncertainties in the, in the climate reconstruction, of course. And I compare it with ideological data points. It is for the Paleolithic. <coughs> there are not many points, and that is one of the concerns that I will mention later on. Um, it's implemented as an agent-based model in Repast. Repast allows you to program in Java. That is where my former experience lies most, so I selected that tool, but many others are available. Um, I'm going to show you these <coughs> parameters, and this is one of the dynamic elements that I hope you like. Uh, the case study that we took is Homo neanderthalensis in Western Europe, um, arguably the most intensively research area. It's basically France that we're talking about. There's a lot of research going on, a lot of data points that we could collect, but I will show you later on that uh, many is not always good. Um, it's about Europe, Northwestern Europe, uh, about 130,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. Explicitly this last uh, 50,000 because I don't want to model modern humans moving in. And we are Pretty sure that everything before 50,000 is Neanderthal. Take care.
I had put nice music underneath. Um, I'm sorry, you're gonna miss that. Um, what I'm going to show you next, I, I, show, I showed you all these parameters because I think you might be interested in some of the implemented details. Um, I, there's a lot of parameters and I don't want to discuss all of them, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, I implemented quite a few. Um, what I'm going to show you could be uh, seizure inducing. Um, if you are sensible, you can please close your eyes. I'm going to show you two simulations parallel. Uh, they are going to show a reconstructed environment changing very quickly because I'm going to show you the whole period that we simulated. That's about 80,000 years put into 40 seconds. Uh, it's going fast, but I want to show you this because I want to illustrate the effect of different parameters on the hominids dispersing through Western Europe. Um, you're going to see dots moving around. They're going to move very quickly because it is compressed time. But I want you to illustrate the different effects. And I hope it works. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. You can see the changing climate when the ice age comes in. In the north, you see the tundra coming and hominins are pushed south. I'm going to explain a little bit about this further on. But you can see that on the left, they are pushed further south than on the right. And in the end, you will see that a lot of um, hominins remain on the right simulation. And on the right simulation, we have a high birth rate and we have a very high cold resistance implemented, where on the left, they have hardly any cold resistance and they have a high death rate in the pre fertile section, that is the really much. Um, but those are not all the differences. Like I said, I, I have many parameters for the hominids. I have 21 parameters. And we are not sure what the sensitivity of the model for each of these parameters is. And we are going to analyze this. But I want to show you this because these are clearly different simulation results. Uh, but in the end, when we evaluate the, um, uh, let's say, uh, what I call the score of each simulation, uh, the right side has clearly the highest score, but the left side does not score zero. It scores about half of the right side. And I will explain that later on, that gives you some of the concerns that we're talking about. Um, first, I would like to talk, talk about the usefulness of hominid space as a tool. Um, a model, as you all know, is a simplification of reality. It is always wrong, and that's one of our major problems in modeling and simulation. Everybody can say this model is wrong because it does not include this and this. So it's always wrong. But uh, some are useful, <coughs> and useful uh, is sometimes defined as uh, giving you a surprise as a modeler or as a viewer. Um, in the initial stages of the development of this tool, we had an idea about an hypothesis that we would like to test. And uh, the results were surprising, which induced us into further developing this tool. Um, the surprising for us. In the Paleolithic, there is still some debate, and it has been an intensive debate about the behavior, uh, the character of the mobility of hominids. Some claim that they are habitat trackers, that is indicated on the left. Um, if it gets colder, they move into these refugia where it's warmer and they stay there until it gets better and go back. And on the right, you say what they call local extinction, which is a, not a correct name, but uh, it could better have been called something like um, staying local or staying or persistence staying. Um, the hominids sweat it out. If it gets colder, they stay and they try to survive and what's still there. Uh, these hypotheses are uh, competing and I think at the moment, um, well, we, we developed this tool to test this hypothesis. Um, and in the end, in all our parameter settings, local extinction performed the best. I'm going to explain you why, and you will say, ah, of course, you should have think, thought about that beforehand. But for us, it came as a surprise, just because of this uh, intense debate on this, on this character. So first you have habitat tracking. They move south when the weather gets bad, and in the end, there's only one left. There's not enough food in the south. There were already hominids present, and when everybody moves south, there's not enough food. The, habit, uh, the local extinctions, they stay, and there's not enough food, but some of them remain. And in the end, after a few iterations, uh, 
there is more homonyms left than in the previous version. So we decided, and that this actually was consistent throughout all the parameter settings. So for us, that was an indication that these Neanderthals do not move south when the weather gets colder, but they try to sweat it out. Um, we have no archaeological proof for this, not as such, uh, but it's a, um, I think it indicates the usefulness of the tool because it surprised us a little bit. I would expect them to move south if the weather gets cold. It's nice here. It's not as nice in the Netherlands. So, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the issues, but I'm not going into them, all of them. Um, of course, you all know about agent-based models. Um, I think we can safely say that agents represent the Neanderthal groups moving to the landscape in a proper way. Um, I'm not going into that now, but I can explain you if you want uh, later on. Uh, the parameterization of homonyms is an essential element of agent-based models. You have to define uh, some parameters which you can change to see the effect of different hypotheses. Um, uh, we selected some based on the energy requirement of homonyms. That's our main assumption. Energy, the, the need for food drives these homonyms. It's an assumption that we took as essential. Um, now, we do use a lot of data sets and tools. You all know about this. We selected, but uh, we try to make it a realistic uh, environment, meaning that we have to use topography in quite a bit of detail and climate reconstruction in quite a bit of detail. Um, verification and validation of the system is something that I will go into uh, in the next slide. And I will also tell you a little bit about the vulnerability, that was one of our issues, about explicit models. Um, I'm going quickly through these. Verification is essential. Verification is, um, did you do a correct model implementation and simulation? So you test all these things in different levels. Validation is more important. I, no, it's equally important, but the validation is something that other people will find very interesting. It's uh, the idea of, does it really represent what you are researching? Eh? Is it a valid model? Can you use it for your research questions? Um, basically, all our parameters implement a research question. Um, weaning age, is that important? Uh, uh, that's the birth rate, actually. Um, how many children do they get? Is that important for uh, uh, colonization of Western Europe or recolonization? So all these parameters that we implemented are hypotheses. And that's why we implemented them. Um, when you look at the global picture, you get an idea. Does it work as expected? But even then, you can get surprises. And then you get the behavior per agent where you can look. Does it represent a valid behavior based on the parameters? And that's how I did some of these validations. Um, statistical analysis, the last point, is something that we think is very important. And it indeed works. Uh, I ran a thousand simulations put some statistics on it and found there is a bug. Energy use of these hominids is not as expected and somewhere deep inside there was something wrong. Statistics show us that. So it, it illustrates to me that statistics are useful. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit our explicit model in the past and for this I show you a, a very short fragment of a movie which I think is a very good illustration of an explicit model Simulation. This filmmaker puts forward his model and makes it explicit. These are Neanderthals moving through the landscape. And we can criticize this all the way down to zero. Huh? Would his hair be like that? Or this clothing <laughs> nicely tailored? But he makes his model explicit. And again, I would like to stress that is the most important element of modeling. This is where you become vulnerable. Okay, the concerns, the use of ethnographic data is still something that we all mm, are a little bit concerned about, but I took ethnographic data as a basis for my parameters and beyond that, I extended them to, uh, to uh, what I think that Neanderthals could be in. Use of comparative data, that's biological data, uh, the same applies here. Assumptions underlying the model, I'm not going into that now because the time limit uh, uh, is, is important to not allow me that. Climate and habitat reconstruction, I am going into because that is the most uh, concern that we have. 
It is notoriously difficult. Habitat reconstruction based on climate parameters is even more difficult. Um, this is a picture of the Mammoth Steppe. Some of these environments that we think were uh, Neanderthal uh, heaven, we don't know how to reconstruct them, which is a problem. Um, here you can see, uh, even for today, heredity for cold environments in the literature is defined as either says 609 or 974 millimeters per year. That's a major difference where you can see in the reconstructed <coughs> environment that green is a very effective environment for the animals. So climate issues. There's a lot of problems when you use climate reconstruction. Um, some of them might be familiar. Other ones like the Emian example, which shows you that the rate of change in the <coughs> south is different as the rate of change in the north is a very important one. It makes that uh, warmer temperatures come 5,000 years later in the north is an issue. Um, I go into this definition of success very shortly. I try to find points of presence and points of absence. And points of absence are almost absent in the Paleolithic record. Which is a problem, because you need these points of absence to find your retreating or your extinction rate rates. Okay, so I have all these sites. They are distributed throughout the area. But in time, you, you see they are concentrated here. In latitude, which is the vertical, they are concentrated in the south. It's a very biased record that we have, although these are 400 days. Um, I will show you the problem with the dates that we have. This is a reconstructed environment for Neanderthals. This is what taphonomy leaves us, and in the end we have only the archaeological bias. These are only these points that we have. Um, based on our research data, we use these radiometric dates, but there are alternatives, like absence and presence in the MIS stages, or the reconstructed environment that we can use, cold versus warm. Uh, this is an example of a problem. We have here uh, at least four periods of presence. However, there is only one reconstructed climate period. This was a cold period. So there is a problem when we want to use either one of them. Um, well, I have shown you that we implemented Neanderthal society. We have problems with climate reconstruction and the data points that we have, or actually that we don't have. And, uh, well, if you have any questions about this reconstruction of Neanderthals, I'm ready for you.